<laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> to... Happy New Year. Oh, Happy New Year. Let's That's start with right. that. Happy New Year. 2024. Can you believe that? Yes. Wow. Ooh. All right. 2024. Uh, <laughs> welcome back to Fresh Perspectives. Um, I'm Mark Brown. And I'm Amanda Thomas. And we're so glad to be back. Uh, so much has happened. In the world. Uh, in every, the world. At uh, Green River. Green everything. River, yeah. Right? It's just... Uh, and January is the start of, I like to call it, pre-Black History Month. Because yes. MLK yes, Day. That is true. That yep. we celebrate in this month, and right. then February kicks off Black History Month. Right. However, yes, we have those two months, but we celebrate Black History every day. Every day. Right? Yes, we do. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about Black love. Yes. In a different way of how we context of what yeah. love is. I would say Black love, self-love. Yes. Would you agree? I would go with that. Okay. We can yeah. do that. Okay. All right. So... Uh, Amanda and I have had some really good conversations about uh, something that's happened recently. And, you know, we don't, one, one of the things I can say is that we have found that we do these podcasts, um, you know, with a lot of things in mind. And, and it's funny because sometimes I think one of our podcasts recently, uh, one of the things that came out of it was it had to do with, I think it was redlining. There was a whole bunch of things that were coming out in the news around yep. some of the systemic things that um, that uh, black and brown folks have experienced um, in this country. Um, this time, we're, gonna, we're delving into something a little bit more, I think, this is actually heavy because it covers a whole lot yeah. of different things. Um, and also triggers some things. And, and it may trigger, yes. And a different emotion. Exactly. So um, I think just as a heads up, this is kind of a little trigger warning because some of what we, we share in this podcast um, is a little bit deep, I think, and could trigger some folks. And so... Um, so I, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. Yes. And then take care of yourself, right? We talked exactly. about self-love right. of taking care of yourself. So if you do need to pause it or walk away right. or you it re-triggers you of a story or a situation that you went through or right. someone else you know that's went through this because we are talking a little bit more about current events. Yeah. That is facing in our community. Right. That is happening on the news. Still talking about right Still now. Still talking about it. On the news. Yeah. So... We're actually engaging in this conversation in our perspective of what we see right. and our viewpoint. And keep right. in mind that people may disagree because me and Mark have conversations where we disagree on mm -hmm. things. And this is where we have our conversations. Yes. So hopefully you guys can continue these conversations after our podcast and engage more with your community or other people who think differently than you. Right. Exactly. Um, and that's honestly, that's one of the ways you learn. Um, you know, being a, 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 you know, in a training role for me, I believe, I believe people need to learn every single day. They need to learn something. Um, and learning from each other is one way to do that. So let's jump in. Um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about, um, actually a lot, <laughs> about Claudine Gay, Dr. Claudine Gay. Um, she was the president at Harvard University. And she recently uh, resigned from her role as president. She's the first black president. And I know Amanda and I were just talking about this, what, yesterday? A couple of, la even last this week, week we were talking about it <laughs> in the past week, that we're still seeing first um, in, in this country, which just seems, you know, 2024 just doesn't seem right. Um, and it's crazy because she was only there shortly six of months. six months. Yeah. Six and months. you have to understand Harvard's history. Like I was doing some research. Mm -hmm. 388 <laughs> years <laughs> for them to have the first yeah. Yeah. black woman president. Mm -hmm. And in Ivy League, she's the second because Brown sure. University. Brown University, Yes. You know, had um, Dr. Ruth Simmons. Yes, yes. You know, so 
that is crazy to me mm-hmm. that there's only been two. Yes. And there's no black man in yeah. Ivy League been president. No. It's only been these two women. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me in itself speaks a lot. And and I think the thing that bothered me the most, and I shared this with with um, Amanda, is Christopher Rufo is a conservative. Um, I'm assuming if I say conservative, he is perhaps Republican and nothing against any political affiliation. I have friends who are across the board and some who don't even vote and that ticks me off, but well, that's another story. Um, but one of the things, and one of the things that he has been working on over the past year, over the past years, is getting rid of critical race theory. Mm-hmm. Um, he actually planted the plagiarism story on Dr. Uh, Dr. Gay. So that was more of a plant. And if you're interested, I have the article where he was interviewed and he shared the exact plan of what he was intending to do. His plan is to get rid of any DEI efforts. Exactly. And that is where his mindset yep. is at, is anything yep. that has to do with DEI right. is a threat yep. to him. Yep. Um, and not just him, but I think to um, dominant culture. Correct. But it's crazy because if we really look at, you know, um, the president of Harvard, former president of Harvard, mm-hmm. She was qualified. Mm-hmm. This wasn't a affirmative action hire. This wasn't, she was qualified. So my thing is, if you're trying to get rid of GEI efforts, okay, okay, do that, boo-boo, do mm-hmm. you. But the range and the knowledge and the expertise that she brought to the table does not make sense to me because if we look on the resume and paper and we just judge based on paper, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. She's qualified. Yes, more than qualified. So... My thing is, is that this DEI effort that you're trying to get rid of is the undertone just anti-blackness. Right, exactly. That anything that has to do with blackness, undertone, is your problem. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if the person is qualified or not. Right. That you just want to get rid of it because you do not want to see anything that black excellence shows up. Right. And one of the things that, and, and, and I love the fact that you raised that because one of the things that I've realized uh, through this whole story um, with um, with Dr. Gay, one of the things that I realized is that this is very typical, and in a lot of the articles that I read and in, in doing research for our, our session today, um, one of the things that I realized is that undermining the intelligence of people of color, and I'm going to say people of color, but I'm going to say black and brown people more specifically, Undermining their intelligence or their ability has been consistent in this country for a long time. Yes. And I am sure that, I don't know if you've ever experienced, I know I've experienced it in my working, my 25 plus years of working, uh, (laughs) I've experienced it. um, And I know other people who have experienced, who've been really kind of ridiculed for or, or, or put down, or in some cases, I would say, put in their place um, because of that. And, and I feel that that's really what has been happening all along. Um, we saw it happen with the um, uh, 1619 Project. Oh, no. Nicole oh. Hannah Jones. Yes. Woo! I'm glad that came. Look Ooh, at this. I was waiting I for knew, that to pop like in my Nicole, head. <laughs> I was like, it's a Nicole day. That's all I do. <laughs> um, it happened with her, and um, and now we're seeing a huge change in North Carolina with uh, the legislature taking over. Um, there is an attack on education right now, mm-hmm. overall. Um, and along with that attack on education, it is hitting black women. Um, I would say hitting um, minorities, but hitting black women especially. So this managed to get rid of affirmative action. Um, he was a culprit in affirmative action. Who is that really affecting? 
Well, well, let's let's look at the statistic, <laughs> white women. But in this right. resign of all these presidents, and not that many, there's only, you know, President Gay. Gray. Gray. Okay. Gay. Yeah. Thank you. Claudine and then Gay. Gray. And then there was the one from Penn State. Yes, I believe Penn State. She resigned, she but resigned. the MIT president woman's like, you ain't going to take me down because right. she didn't resign. <laughs> she said, check me later. <laughs> Mark Lemons. But she resigned, too. Mm-hmm. And that's why my brain is like, this is not a DEI effort. Because when you really look at diversity, equity, inclusion, a lot of times it's race. Yes. And they attack race. Mm-hmm. And what I'm noticing more and more is the fact that they don't care. Like, they'll even attack their own yes. people. Right. Because right. she's a white woman. Right. And you were like, I'm going to sacrifice this white woman because I'm going to get this black woman. Right. So I'm going to hit everything that I can give yeah. because that white woman going to stay on her feet and figure her stuff out. But this black woman, I want to have a crusade. Yes. Because you didn't go on a podcast or go on to be interviewed right. to talk about both of the women, right. you were strategic in the way you said, I'm taking down this black I'm woman, that all my energy, yep. this black woman, her whole well-being yep. bothered you. Yes. Her qualifications, everything about her bothered you. Right. Yes. So taking that into account, let's, let's look at over the past year, all of the different women leaders that have had, um, who have been moved into prominent positions, who have had to deal with some sort of microaggression, uh, treatment, poor treatment. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, the first black female U.S. Supreme Court justice. Um, If anybody watched those hearings, some of the questions, some of the idiocy that came out of that. The disrespect, just, the let's disrespect, just call it out. Yes, was unbelievable. Um, and this came a lot from the conservative uh, politicians in the process of that. Um, then we talked about Nicole Hannah-Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, she is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer for the New York Times. Um, was denied tenure at the University of North Carolina despite the school appointing her to a position. Mm-hmm. Um, and that typically comes with tenure. But just to add to that, yeah. to make a tenure, yep. I was looking at the statistics of this mm-hmm. from a PhD. So black women earn PhD from the National Science Foundation, 4.4%. Mm-hmm. Who become faculty afterwards, that means you have a job. Mm-hmm. You're looking at 3.2% of black women. Okay. It's very small numbers compared to the other colleagues of 30%. Mm -hmm. So when we really look at this, Mm -hmm. of you're now talking about somebody's livelihood again. Yes. Because she got a whole PhD. She done this research and all of this to lead to having a job. That's the goal, basically, Mm -hmm. of the work she was trying to do. Exactly. Exactly. So when we look at, um, and then there was the one in, and I don't have her name, which is uh, very disappointing for me, the one down in Texas, who was actually offered a job. And I can't remember her name. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And that happened last year. That was over the summer. But could we take all this back to, let's be truly honest, Michelle Obama and the disrespect when she received. Yep. Yep. Having more education right. than her husband. Yes. And then most people on Congress, let's not talk about them and some of those judges. Right. <laughs> of That's the true. disrespect they treated her. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this true. is not just what we're talking specifically is higher education. Right. But this goes cross higher education. It hits everything. It hits everything. And, yeah. you know, me and you have talked about the situation with... Um, Dr. Gay, mm-hmm. about, like, she resigned, Amanda. And I'm like, I got you, Brown. <laughs> like, I got you on that. <laughs> I know. But the undertone of the fact that she got sick and tired, and that's where my brain, and I was reading a lot of articles of 
black women just getting sick and tired of being tokenized, right. undermined, disrespected, disrespected, the microaggressions, the, the poor treatment in higher education, not just from colleagues but from students. But from students. So it's not just one way of now I have to prove myself to my colleague. Right. Now these students are questioning me. Yeah. And putting more load on black women right. and black employees. So, with that being said, where do you think that doubt is? Who places that doubt? I mean, I, I have an answer, but I'm just But I also there. think, so this is where my root comes mm -hmm. from. I think the problem is, and I know this is going to not surprise people, is the representation not seen. I grew up knowing mm -hmm. that there was black professors. Oh yeah. I understood. My mama made yep. sure in that black yep. household yep. Yep. <laughs> that I knew these scholars and who they are and the greatness of being a mm -hmm. black person mm -hmm. in America and what we contribute. Mm -hmm. But if white America only sees white professors, white instructors, all of white institution, and you bring this black girl into the classroom, you're like, right. who are you? And question so, their abilities. Right, right. Because it's historically of them questioning our abilities always. All the time. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right? And that's, and that's, where, this, I, that's where I was going. Like, who, the, who plants that? They're the ones who plant it. Dumb and the culture plants it. Yeah. And it makes it easier for white supremacists to plant doubt. Because it didn't take that long to take this black woman down when you have white supremacists already rooted in the foundations of higher education. Right. And if we really want to talk about Harvard's founders, those were the slave masters. Those were people who had slaves. Uh, how many of them were racist? How many of them dealt with... And how dare you put this right. black woman in charge right. of this Ivy League? Right. How <laughs> dominant, you know, right. this this place where they, how dare you? Mm -hmm. And I think that attitude of like, you can't go to Harvard, like, right. no, you can't. Right. This black girl? Right. So part of what I see in all of this is really an attack. And I said this earlier, it's an attack on education which from the conservative side, you know, there's this whole wokeness, which is a black term that has been co-opted. Um, a lot of terms uh, have been out there by black and brown folks have been co-opted by um, the other side, so to speak, and they're using it as a negative. Um, but I also think both sides take this extreme, extreme approach when it comes to our community, right? Well, because. Yeah. Like conservatives take it into a negative aspect. Of, of course, of course. Of something beautiful in our country and right. in, in our culture and right. stuff like that. Right. Of like, you guys just need to come to us this way. And you're like, like the people did in the civil rights with their suits. Yeah, and we that, tried that. We, yeah. we tried that. So we can't come. Okay, so we did the suits mm -hmm. and you still treated yeah. us salty and dehumanize us. In that moment. Right. And then you have the left who want to save us and be a savior in this, but like, don't know how to do but it. don't know how to do it <laughs> and don't know how to understand black culture <laughs> and that. So it's right. like this extreme part. And if people think like, OK, black people just go. No, we we think for our own selves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be truly honest, both sides to me, I side eye every day <laughs> because there are problematic ways on both ends of yep. this extreme approach. Yep. Do we have problems in our community? Yes. Does other people have problems in our community? Yes. yes. Do we understand some of the history of why our problems are here? Yes. yes. <laughs> Do we know how to fix some of them? Yes. yes. But when we try to fix them and we try to put a black woman president out there you fire within six months mm -hmm. right yeah. or when we try a different route you you make barriers That's exactly and then you right. act like i don't know why they upset i don't know why they're protesting i, I don't what i'm confused do? oh, no. i'm confused so if you look at our history and i think part of this conversation we, we've had it's like been kind of uh getting getting each other riled up here uh, <laughs> <laughs> but and when we think about what is that saying? Uh, oh, well, if they could just lift themselves up by the bootstraps. bootstraps. Okay. They can so, just figure it out. So let's go back to 19, what, 1921, I think it was, Tulsa. Whole neighborhood. Burned whole it. city. 
And Tulsa wasn't the only massacre. And Tulsa was not the only massacre. And if anybody's interested, we can send you a list of all the massacres that happened across this country. Um, but when you think about people minding their own business, we had dentists, doctors, lawyers, movie theaters, uh, uh, barbershops. barbershops, I mean, you name it. A very thriving community. Yes, we did. And all it took was for someone to accuse a black man of, and actually what happened apparently from what I've I've read is that he stepped on the foot of some white woman. Mm -hmm. And that triggered everybody to go, oh. And what did they do? They, they killed almost, what, 300 folks, burned the city down to the ground. We have seen that continuously. So anytime we have tried to move take forward. care of our own, yep. move forward, make a difference, we get pushed roadblock. back. We get roadblocks. We get, get policies. We get laws. We get everything exactly. changes on us, right? right. You know, previous um, episode, we talked about lawyers mm -hmm. where you just had to go to law school. Right. And then... When black people tried to go to law school, oh, now, now we got to get the bar now involved. Now you have to do the bar involved. When we yeah. integrated black teachers mm -hmm. <laughs> in the K through 12 system, now we have to have the test, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to test you state standardized tests, and black right. people weren't passing right. that test. Right. So it's like you keep changing the rules because you want to make sure again, to see if we qualified or not under exactly. your standard. Exactly. But we were thriving in our communities without your standards yeah. because we were doing our own standards to our community right. Right. and our own expectations. Exactly. And I think that white America and black America is too different. And for black people to feel like they have to thrive in white America, no, no. I think Dante King has freed a lot of us here as in black employees or just reiterate some stuff that we're no longer accepting right. of that. Right. Exactly. But we have to also realize that they are the dominant culture mm -hmm. and they set the rules and the expectations. Right. And we have to live in that. Yep. But we also have to realize that we have to love ourselves enough to maybe walk away. If we have to walk to, away, that we can do that. Right. Yeah. And I think Dante talked about that when he was here mm -hmm. of like, you got to love yourself enough to say enough is enough. I can't do this anymore. No. And that's what I felt in that moment mm -hmm. when um, Dr. Gay decided to resign. Mm -hmm. It was a love, and I, you know, I don't know her, and, you right. know, can't put my, but I'm just thinking of all the crap I probably went through if I was her, mm -hmm. be the president, if I oh, said, yeah. and all oh, this yeah. little thing, right. to say, I got to love myself enough to just walk away mm -hmm. because it's it's not worth it right. of my peace. Right. And what I love about our community in this situation, mm -hmm. to see so many black women just rally, mm -hmm. just and, and rally of love and yeah. just saying like, me too, I experienced some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Me too, I experienced some microaggressions. That's why I had to walk away. Mm -hmm. Higher education needs to change. Yes. yes. You know, Harvard needs to change. Mm -hmm. Like these things, and it, it's beautiful to see that People don't even know this woman. Right. But black but, women but were like... But they've had... She's had more support, I think, in this particular instance. And and I don't know... And I mean, I, I, I was just like, all right. You know, I was applauding the fact that she was even... It was like, Harvard? Really? She got... They, oh, look at Harvard. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, they're moving on up. Um but then to see this all transpire. And I think that the interview with Cruz Rufo that was done, after reading that, I became incredibly angry because this is one of three people who are really trying to take us backwards. Yes, strategically. Strategically. But it's not surprising strategically. It's not. Because the no. book has already been written multiple times. Yes. He's only just taken the manual from the white supremacist, dusted off, and just, you know, changed the, just, the title. Yeah. But everything else heard strategically, let's be yeah. truly honest, yeah. is the same. It's the same. From the police, how they form. Right. Where they were 
slave catchers right. to now police officers. Right. There's still the same mentality there. He just changed the title just, of the cover. That's, that's exactly, all he that's did it. was that's strategic. Exactly right. And that's the crazy part yep. is, is that America has not changed mm -hmm. because it only took six months for her to resign. Right, right. That yeah. his power of white supremacists took over. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about her, her abilities to lead because that's not in question. Yeah. What he did was like, I think you plagiarize mm -hmm. and this is where I'm going to attack you. I'm going to attack you on... On your work. That's right. Because he didn't attack the white woman from Penn. Yep. It was strategically trying to... It was uh, to undermine her ability. And say, why are you picking another black person? Because you don't need black people. Mm -hmm. Just exactly. pick another white person exactly. like usual. You know, so this... And I was thinking about this as we were... I was thinking about this last night a little bit. Um, it takes me back to a time when, um, and I just remember, and I think I shared this in one of our podcasts, but there was a moment in time where I just looked at my mom and dad and I said, you know, and I, I think it was probably about 12 or 15. And I, I just, we were sitting at home and I just said, why do they hate us so much? What have we done? It's pretty prolific for a 13 year old. I mean, thing. yeah, we're over um, here. <laughs> Mr. Connected. Look at you. Um, but what have we done to make these folks hate us so much? Because you brought us over here. You uh, had people working in the fields morning to night. Turned around, called us lazy. Mm-hmm told us we were no good. Mm -hmm. We were not even considered human. And assaulted us. Assaulted. Um, ran birthing farms. Mm -hmm. And with all of that, and, and, and my, I just remember my parents just, I think they were kind of like shocked that I, you know, look, look at this 13 year old. Yeah, what is wrong with my child? <laughs> um, but I just remembered them just saying, it's not all of it's not all of them, but the ones that there's nothing you can really do about the ones. And, and I try to make sure people understand that there's nothing you can do about the ones that hate you, whether it's Chris Rufo or somebody else. If they don't like you, that's fine. That's why my mother always said, I love being in the South because at least you know where you stand. Amen. <laughs> um, so... I think for me, when I look at this, yeah, it makes me extremely angry. But one of the other things that we had that we were going to talk about was resilience. And we are resilient. We're still here. Even when they wanted to put us all in one area, deny medical care, and hopefully over a couple of generations, Black folks would no longer be here because we would die off. We're still here. So at what point... Do these folks decide, okay, they're still here. We can't get rid of them. So how do we work together? Do you think that's ever going to happen? No. <laughs> First of all. I was waiting for you to lean in and do that. Uh, that was not scripted. I just want you to know. Uh, First of all, <laughs> I know you have that resilient and hopefulness. <laughs> No, no, no. The whole, that, that's gone. The resilientness. You know, I, I, I'm tired, Mark. Mm -hmm. I was talking to someone today. I, I'm tired. I know. I, 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 know. I want to demolish the black, strong black woman. Mm -hmm. I want to be weak. I want to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of fighting. I'm mm -hmm. tired of fighting. And yes, there are problematic people. Yes, there's racist people in the world. But the problem is, is that his voice was loud. And I don't... Mm -hmm. Who That's is true. silencing his voice? The problem is, is that we have too many white people who call themselves allies, who, who are pushing silence. Back. I agree. I agree. Their silence is telling me you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. you're, you, I don't know what to do. What do you mean you don't know what to do? How do I know what to do to figure out how to protect right. myself in this fight? And you don't know what to and do. you don't know what to do. Exactly. Your yeah. silence is the problem. Yeah. Or your... It, 
it's, it's not that bad or you taking it too personal. Yeah. Why do we have to talk about race? Do we really need to have GEI efforts in higher education? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really just want to focus on this subject. That's what I got hired to do. Right. I so I really do don't care yeah. about those things. And I treat everyone fairly here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't see color. Oh and oh my goodness. I think, oh, I'm, oh, this is getting me upset now. <laughs> right? Like, these are the no, excuses you're exactly, no, you're exactly that right. are always you are made. Exactly right. And what yeah. you're doing is basically gaslighting me. Yeah. And you're oh, assaulting yeah. my intelligence yeah. at this point. Yeah. Because if, it, if we, if you say I don't see color, then why are your students coming over here and telling us that they have a problem with the racism that you are doing? Right. If you don't, if you're just teaching your subject matter. Right then why is your subject matter problematic of how they're researching and looking at black bodies when they look at that? Mm -hmm. well, you exactly you right. can't just say, not my problem anymore, because these students are coming to you, and I'm sorry that they're not all white European-centric, and sorry they're not all middle class mm -hmm. and looking that everybody swiped the same way. Right. Like, these things, those years are over. Yeah. Unless you try to find yourself in a rural place where there is no Latino there, mm -hmm. okay, then you need to go find your something else because this is not the culture for right. you. Because what you're doing is harmful. It's harmful and it's hurtful and it makes people leave. That's the that's to me, that's the thing, is that you know, any place that you work where you have a Multi multicultural group of people. Um, one of the, one of the things I love is that you learn so much from these folks. You learn so much, and I and again being in that in my role, that is what I enjoy the most. Um, not only that, but think about all of the different ideas that come out of it. When we think about DEI, these are all ideas that come out. Um, new ideas, new thoughts. Uh, new ways of doing things. These are the important pieces that we miss by bringing in people who are different and, and supporting them. Agree. And um, I think also the problem is, and I don't think they see it in this way, where they think, okay, we just need to teach the history. Mm -hmm. Whose history are we teaching? Yeah. Because you, what you're telling us is that Latino history that is American grain is American history. Black history is American history. Right. Like all indigenous history is American, American his history. history. Yeah, exactly. And they have their own because we should be learning more from them too. Exactly. But you're picking and choosing because, oh, oh, because we can't talk about critical race because really, it hurts somebody's feelings. But you were okay teaching about slavery mm -hmm. that hurts these black children's feelings right. when they hear that their people are only yeah. enslaved and that's the only thing they can talk about is right. slavery yeah. and not talking about black excellence. Yeah, that's true. No, that's exactly right. And you I only that. can talk about our trauma, yeah. but you can never talk about the excellence that bring to the table. Yeah. And that is a problem. Yeah. It is. And that's what needs to change. If we're going to talk about DEI efforts then you also have to talk about the history. What are you as, what are you afraid of? I think, the, I guess, and, and I, I guess that's another one of those questions that I ask consistently uh, in my time, just thinking to myself. It's like, what are people really afraid of? And is it really going to hurt a kid's feelings to learn how people were treated during slavery? I was... Listen, I can't even remember. I think I was sat down. Well, my mama always echo because you know my mama. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm black in America. Mm -hmm. So that was already ingrained at me at yeah, five, six, yeah. seven, right. eight yeah, I years old. I already knew that I was black in America. My right. mama made sure right. that I knew right. who I was. Yeah. Did it scare me? Was I like, oh, I can't talk to white people? No. no. My mama didn't do no. that. No. What it did and just... Similar to you, what it did for me is it, it instilled um, a sense of I don't know, pride, a sense of who I am as a person. Um, an awareness. And an awareness, yes. That, that's, a, that's a good word, and, an awareness. And sometimes yeah. the awareness, so let me be honest, 
it's a little scary because then you're like, okay, I'm not the same as, you know, some of my colleagues, college, counter colleagues yeah. who are yeah. white. Like right. I walk in the world a little bit differently. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, my feelings still haven't got hurt because when my mama always says, I mean, you black in America, I understand like the rules don't apply to me the same right. way as They're not for the same. white people, yeah. you know, but did it again. Mm -hmm. So if black people are already teaching their kids at a younger age, mm -hmm. already this stuff yeah. of how to navigate the world mm -hmm. being black. Yeah. And some people do it consciously or unconsciously mm -hmm. of how they educate their children as black children. Yes. And I understand yeah. that. Then why can't other students, other children, white children, understand how this world works too? Because at the end of the day, you're going to be working with the same people, the people of color. Well, let's put it this way. They are being taught, in some cases, how their role works in the world. That is true. They are being taught. And that's why we're having difficulty in some cases changing. Because the story keeps happening. Mm-hmm. And until we change the narrative, until the story gets changed, until those folks that we call our allies or whatever we abolitionists Listen, or whatever we're calling, we're calling them, them. Uh, until those folks really step into the fray and start learning and start speaking up, it's going to be the same. It's, it's going to be a continuous thing. And I remember one of the things I always wanted to uh, and somebody asked me this question, do I ever think I will see an end to racism in this country? <laughs> my, 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 Someone asked me that question. I'm, my, just, telling, I'm just telling my, you somebody asked me that question. So, hold up, and, hold up. <laughs> were they in the right mind, Mark, when they asked you no, that? We were not drinking. Nothing. Okay, I just okay. had to ask that question. Because we sometimes people... And I said, you know, I said, I just remember saying, I would hope so, but I don't think so. No. I don't think it's ever going to, in my lifetime, no. My lifetime, no. no. I know you're younger than I am. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> so should I be a little more hopeful than you? No. <laughs> no, it's, it's not, not, it's it's not, not going to happen. No. No. Do I think the DEI effort that has been put out in the media mm -hmm. has had some bumps and some setbacks of how they yeah. you know yeah. package this right, right, right. Yes. yes I absolutely agree yeah. but it's interesting that I learned more DEI effort in the 90s with white conservative women like what I'm hearing right now and I'm like this so, is weird but, but here's the thing so a lot of the stuff from the 90s and I remember <laughs> Right. I remember the stuff from the nineties. It's just been repackaged. Is it's that been what it repackaged, is? Repackaged, renamed, and so we're not really learning anything new. And part of it is uh, this is just my own opinion: is that it's been repackaged and it's just it's just coming back in a different way, a different form. Different language is used. There are yes. getting more different people are getting involved in it. So until we. You know, so for me, the way I look at it, it's just a circle. And and we're, we're caught in this circle. And until somebody, it's like, do not, do you remember? I know you've been on one of these. You know, those things at the playground where it goes around, what are those called? The miracle-round? The miracle-round, yeah. yeah. And, but you had, you ran. And, and you, you had to on, And you had to jump on. And then they spin, because you were the spinner. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> so now I'm just waiting for someone to fly off of that. And what I mean, what I mean by that Who will is, this? <laughs> no, what I mean by this, I, I don't know if people are going to follow, they're going to say market, right? but what I'm saying is, is that from the 90s to now, it's been repackaged. It's been a circle. We've been in this loop. Now we need someone who can spin off and actually, like, really define the work and start getting people to see. So that's, so that's who, my who? I don't know who it is. And then, who are the people who need to see? Well, you know who the people are. Why are you asking me that question? I, some, people, <laughs> some people may not know who they are. I have realized in higher ed that when you say things, 
when you try to do that passive aggressiveness that we do in higher education <laughs> right, right, or right. in the great Northwest, <laughs> I've tried to explain <laughs> that things need to change right. and try to be like, well, we have these anti-racist issues yes. that we need, to we need to address. And then people don't think they're talking to them when it's really like, baby, we are talking, we to, are you. talking to, to you. To yes. you. You are the problem. The folks that need to hear it the most are the ones we just talked about, the abolitionists, those allies, or whatever they want to call themselves. Um, they're the ones that need to hear it most. And they're the ones who are still afraid, even That's, from the 90s. Let's go back to the 80s, because they were afraid in the 80s. They were afraid, well, honey, they were afraid in the 30s and the 40s <laughs> they were and so the 50s. And, <laughs> actually, I will say... 50s, 60s, there was a lot, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of support during that time period. But then what happened? They just slacked off. They, they thought they were done. Well, that's... I feel like that was point. the mindset. That was, yeah, that's, that's true. Of, that's probably a very And that's point. what I feel also when yeah. people are like... Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And yes, how you feel about the organization, I understand it can be controversial. Mm -hmm. But the slogan of Black Lives Matter, my life matter as a black person, right. I'm taking it in that context. Yeah. Still, people don't, like, they thought, okay, we're done with that. George Floyd, we're done with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Brianna Taylor, we're done with that. Right. Like, I don't think they understand. This is not done. Like, the chapter's not closed. This is a continuous thing that you have to continue to show yeah. up. And I think that's the problem I'm having is that higher ed is about trends. And when the trends look good and we are like, okay, now, okay, we're going to listen to black people right now. Okay, okay. Okay, listen to black people right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're done listening to black people. Now we're on this issue. Yeah. It's like, no, baby, you haven't addressed none of these issues. Right. You haven't done anything. You sat and listened. Well, you gave me some money. Right. A couple coins. I yeah. appreciate the coins. But at the end of the day, you have not made real change. So let's, let's look at it. It's consistent. Oh, let's listen to the black people. Let's listen to the indigenous people. Let's listen to the Latino people. Let's listen to the Asian people. It's the same thing. It's part of that circle. And until we find, until someone decides to say, look, we've got to stop jumping on, going around, jumping off, pushing, them more, pushing some more, jumping back on, Someone's going to have to stop the wheel from turning and just say, look, now is the time for change. Now is the time for us to make a difference. Everyone has to have a voice and everyone has to speak up. And it's not our responsibility. No. And we are not trends. We are human beings. Exactly. Exactly. Stop making us your trend. Fashionable. Don't so make speak. us our hashtag. Yeah. I don't need your support. That it's not right. real support. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's the problem with higher ed more and more. Mm -hmm. Because having her as the first president mm -hmm. was a trend. I say that because mm -hmm. they weren't ready to support. Because I realized more and more that mm -hmm. more DEI VPs coming up, more, you know, figuring out more people of color as presidents. Mm -hmm. But no one knows how to support them. <laughs> we have more black faculty coming on board. Bravo. Do we do we know? And I'm not saying when I say we, let me be clear. Black people know how to support black people. Yeah. We've done a great we job. We've done a great here. job loving our people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially here, yes. yes. But there we can't be the only ones loving on this person and supporting this person. That is That's the problem right. I'm having because it's a trend. That's exactly right. And then the scrutiny that they went through, because I yep. bet you in those little higher committees, they they went to where school? Mm -hmm. Is that a legit school? Is their research real? Mm -hmm. Can we really? <laughs> they didn't write a lot on their DEI. And yes, they're a person of color, but still, as a white person, I don't yep. understand why they didn't put anything. Maybe you just learned about DEI two seconds ago, right. and now you will be expert. <laughs> Yes, I went to five workshops, <laughs> and I know everything I need to know. And right. What have you put into practice? Yeah. And, and that's my biggest thing, and I will stick to that to the day I die. If you are doing DEI work, 
you better be putting something into practice. Because if you're not, it's all it's all it's worthless. You're yeah. not doing anything. And you're not doing anybody yourself or anybody else any good. Um, so yeah. So um, I was going to jump back to the point that you were just making, and my brain just went <laughs> off off to the um, somewhere. I don't know where it went. <laughs> um, but no, I think I think for us going forward. Um, and I think knowing everything that we've just talked about, um, I, I hope the best for um, Dr. Gay. Um, she's back uh, faculty back at Harvard. I think it's going to be a hard road for her. And I, the reason I say that is because they have done such a good job of planting the plagiarism story that it's it could be very hard for her to come out of that in an academic setting. Um, I am still a firm believer that higher ed is anywhere from 10 to 20 to even 30 years behind in most things. Uh, some of the books that some of these instructors are teaching are back in the day. I've, and then they're problematic. So if that. if we <laughs> are still having books that students are teaching in the 90s, yes. I, we have been be we've been far behind yes. yeah. in this. Yeah. And so our goal is, excuse me, my water. Um, our goal is is really to try to figure out the best way, and I say us, but not necessarily us, but um, higher ed needs to figure out better ways of supporting people, people of color when they come in the door. We have to, you know, we've already, we already do that. Exactly. But how do we support them otherwise? And it's not about, oh, hey, Amanda, so guess what? So we have this new person. Can you just, can you just like walk them around and can you just? Oh, because you're black and they're black. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys should have a lot in common because you're both black. And, and I don't know what to, to do, do to support them. Or say, because, you know, I'm not black. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're like, you hired this person yeah. knowing they were black. This wasn't a surprise. Right. <laughs> I'm black. You saw them. Yes. It's That's not, the crazy it, part. It, it should not be our responsibility to mentor them from that standpoint. You have to figure out how to onboard, how to, how to take care of them and understand that there are questions you need to be asking about how, how do you want to learn? How do you want this? How, how do, you're not gonna ask those questions any differently than you're gonna ask, uh, say, a white person or you, there are certain things that you need to know when you're bringing somebody on. As far as getting them to understand the culture, we can help with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can paint that picture very we easily. Can, we can we are very good at that in uh, that part. But higher ed does not um, generally, and, and that's something that I've been working on doing, I know, uh, in terms of like orientation and everything, but we don't do a good job of holding on to our books. And it's across the um, it's across the board. It's not just Green River College, it's colleges across the country. Um, there was, this was oh, three, four years ago, um, hashtag something, I forgot, it was hashtag, it was on before Ding Dong Punch, I think they call them that, uh, before uh, Twitter became X. Um, it was uh, hashtag. Please cut that out of there. Oh. <laughs> it was hashtag something in the ivory. Uh, Black in the ivory is what it was called. And it was all these people, like um, one, um, I remember this distinctly one black person um, talking about going in to the office to get their mail another faculty coming in and saying, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be cleaning the floors or the desk or something? And they just looked at that. They were like stunned. Like, I'm a faculty member here. I'm here to get my mail. Um, we don't do a good job of connecting folks in higher ed, as, as, as my concern. 
And, and we, this example is nothing new here. And that's nothing new. Because right. well, there has been plenty of black employees who have got mistaken for students. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. We had plenty of black employees who they need to smile more. Yeah, been told that. Or their voices, their natural voices, intimidates people. <laughs> right? You have people who question them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they belong here? Right. So these are not nothing new right. of like stories because they're happening they're here happening. at Green River. They this happen. is not distance. Right. That's true. And I think that, you know, to that point is we've got to be better. When I think about this information, I know you have stuff on your phone. I'm old school. I got my little sheets of paper here. Uh, <laughs> Don't be shaving me. I do have paper sometimes. No, no, that's good that you had it on your phone. I needed to save important. it because just the case. <laughs> but we have to do better. Um, not just our own organization, but organizations across the country, I think have to do a better job. Mm -hmm. I say have to. Nobody ever has to. But in order for change to happen, and if that's what they're really choosing to do, then they're going to have to put the work in. Let me translate. If you want to hit your goals and targets and get more money from the state and all the things you love about capital society and having your colleagues look really good in the news, the paper and everything mm -hmm. like that, you're going to need to get on board with DEI. You're going to need to get on board of actually understanding your black employees, your black faculty, your black students. You just need to get on board. Yep. Sorry. Like, this is what it is. Yeah. That's exactly it. Thank you for... Um, I'll translation. Thank you for translation. <laughs> because that's what it is. And it's not no, a... You're right, you're it's right. a we thing. It's not a we thing because communities are doing this internal yeah. here yeah. of trying to gather and cultivate and be there for their communities. Mm -hmm. The problem is the dominant people here, the majority of people of here, is not doing their jobs to really cultivate, to cultivate a... And, and build, a those build relationships. Yes. Those relationships of... People. You do belong here. And I'm not going to question who you are and your humanity of why you're here. Right. And I'm going to stand with you in and doing gonna, this. And I'm going to work with you. Together. All the pieces that need to be. Made. But I, what I don't need, right. I don't need your email to tell me, great job. Right. Really don't need that. Um, also, I don't need you to, again, you black, I'm black, so I must have to talk to this person. <laughs> We got to stop that. <laughs> we also have to stop this idea of like, why do we need DEI? Mm -hmm. If you asking that question, you are the problem. Yep, I agree with and that if too. you don't understand why we need DEI, mm -hmm. then you do not have a diverse group of friends. Yep. And if you don't know why we don't need DEI, you also don't know the history of America. Right. If you know the history, you understand why we need these things. We important. understand these structures exactly. and why it is important in decision makings, how we perceive things, how we create policy, mm -hmm. how we set expectations. Exactly. Yeah. That is the problem. Yeah. But what I also want to tie this up to realize, too, in the work we've been always doing, Mark, is that for our community is to love ourselves. Yes. because. To rally around each other, what I saw, again, is a sense of love. Mm -hmm. I love seeing Black women commentary and Black men commentary really supporting this sister in this time, in this time and yeah. not knowing. I, yeah. And it brings me back to Green River of how we come together mm -hmm. and support each other and rally around each other. And even when I was the Black Caucus chair, you know, mm -hmm. some people would be like... What I ain't got. To, I mean, I'd be like, "Come on, we got it." They'd be like, "Okay, man, I'm coming over there, yeah. and let's rally around this person yeah. with love, yeah. and let's support them, and whatever decision making they want to do, we're here to support them." That's and I think that's the most beautiful and powerful thing is for our community to love each other, mm -hmm. good or bad, good or bad, we're that we love you. each other yeah. as sisters and brothers, and that's how we look at each other exactly and that. this work. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I and I. You know, and I bring it up often when I have the opportunity, how important it has been for me 
moving here from Michigan, how important the Black Caucus has been for me. Um, you've become my family, and that and and that is what you call me, Uncle Mark. Uh, you're my so. uncle, you know. We <laughs> family, Mark. We are family. You I, met my mama I, and my I, auntie, I know so your mama and your auntie. you know. I can talk to you on the phone. Hello, and say, hey, right? Tell your mama I said hello. Right. Uh, I saw your sister. <laughs> you saw my we sister? we, we yep. Zoom talk. <laughs> right. So we family at this point, Mark. <laughs> um, but there's there's we have so much more to, more work to do and so much to um, we have a lot to be thankful for. Too. Yeah. And, I, and, and that I am grateful for. So I'm grateful for, um, grateful for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, grateful for our, our Black Caucus. Um, I know that we have been very supportive of the Latina Caucus. We've uh, been supportive of... Uh, the PIA. The, P, the PIA. We, even our white... Caucus. Even our white caucus. Well, white accountability. Group. White, white accountability. I, like, I like to... I like that. Yes. White, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But Don't be ashamed of them. Okay, no, no, no. I I, I like teasing. white accountability I group. I, 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 I love teasing, them. I was teasing right about that. But, Don't uh, be going for my right. You I know, know I love me that. some right. That's my butt. That's my butt. <laughs> um, so we, I think, because of our strength, we've been able to help support um, these other uh, affinity groups, and I and I think that's really important. Um, and we will rally around anybody who we feel, if they need us, we're there. Um, and when we rally, just to be honest, because you know this is all people, you're going to have to deal with the fact that we have to have to come to Jesus moments in these rallies of love. Yeah. Because oh, this, yes. this is not, if y'all pick up a phone to call black people, black people are going to ask questions. We're going to ask questions. And then we're going to side eye you and say some things too and say you were wrong <laughs> behind the scenes and have a moment of what the heck did you get yourself into? Right. Okay, you were absolutely out of line, out of pocket. But yeah. and get into you. Now, when we had that conversation after that, then we talk about, okay, this is how we're going to support you. Yeah. Or this is what you need to do to go apologize. Right. <laughs> because that is the love we have in our community. That's exactly it. And it's about taking responsibility, too. And, and we don't mince words when it's, when it's like, you need to take responsibility for this. Because in black households, you take accountability. You, you, there, you that are word. Accountable. Oh, my gosh. The A word? Ooh. Oh, Lord, have mercy. That's... If you didn't, oh. Oh, see, we're giving each other. Yeah, we, we both yeah. know what that's all about. I'm going to take that. Uh, you don't. <laughs> we don't have to define it. Your no. black mama is going to tell you. Oh, or your black, or your black daddy. One of da- them, uh, uh, don't let grandma tell you. Don't, don't, let the, don't let your daddy do anything. I could tell you stories. But, anyway, um, but yeah, um, I think the, the whole thing around accountability is... is a huge part of the, I think, of black culture. Um, but it's also part of the love. That I don't think it is part of the love. people understand that part when right. they look at accountability. Right. They look at it as a, like, okay, accountability. But it's it's love because if somebody pulled me aside mm-hmm. and said, Amanda, you tripping, da 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 I don't take it as an offense. I take it as love because this person loved me enough to pull me aside, pull aside out of love. Yep. And we have a relationship that... And yeah. even if we don't have like a bestie relationship, but I know your intentions, mm-hmm. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. The thing that, and, and I'm sure you feel <laughs> the same way, but um, the thing that I always loved is it could be a neighbor down the street. It could be somebody at church. It could be if they pulled you aside and said, straighten up. You straightened up. Yes, you did. Because <laughs> you know it's going to get to your mama. Because the minute it gets to your mama, you, you are, already going to get chewed up. Trouble. <laughs> you get chewed up twice. Because you did it publicly. Yes, yes, yes. That's the problem. That's the problem. But we laugh, and when we hear about accountability, mm-hmm. it doesn't scare us. It's like, yep. but I realize here at Green River, when people say it, like, how do we do it? I don't understand. How do you, how well, do we hold we have to, to define, define it? First. it? Yes. And it's like, in black households, like, we've been defining this? Yeah. <laughs> this is old? Yeah, this is old for us. We you know? know? Yeah. Side eye was real. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The look, was, the look real. was real. You know? Yep. 
so. The side conversation and the whisper. Whew, don't get whispered in church. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. You in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So. But we survived. We survived it. And it molded us to say, I need to take accountability for my actions yeah. when things happen. And, and that's hold, part and of we hold ourselves responsible. Right? We just hold ourselves responsible. So I, th- I think it's time for us to, um, again, uh, I always enjoy our conversations. Know, this is good. Um, uh, I don't think. I don't think you got out of control today. First of all, I was a little worried about you. You were a little spicy. <laughs> I know, I know. I was, Before I was, we even recorded. I, was, I know. I was trying to... I was, trying I was to, a little worried. I, I was, was like... trying to remove the Malcolm X out of my... <laughs> if you want to call that Malcolm X, I was going to call you Cat Williams with your shadiness t- today. <laughs> but I digress. Um, but this was uh, a good episode. But this is good. And um, I really do hope the best for, for Dr. Gay and... For the other women who are experiencing uh, the microaggressions and the poor treatments uh, that they are experiencing, we lift them all up. Yes. And um, and we didn't touch on black men, but we also lift them uh, up because I, we yes. know it shows up for them. Yes, it does. Show we up realize for that, and hopefully they have a community. Both of them have communities that can love on that them. That can love on them. Yeah. And also them to learn to love themselves enough to maybe just walk away. To just walk. Away. To save their peace, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah. and then for the Black Caucus employees here, you know, we understand, we see you, we love you, mm-hmm. we value you. Yeah. We're not going to question your humanity, right? And if no one has told you today, you are loved, you are powerful, yeah. and we are happy that and you're we're here. Happy you're here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So with that, we wrap up our fourth episode. Of, it's our first one for 2024. Oh, yes. And our fourth episode for the second season. I want to thank you um, for just, just being who you are. Oh, thank you. Because that means you. a lot. So. Thank you, Uncle Mark. You're I welcome. love you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And we are out. Bye. Bye.